No, you're we're on you're YouTube. You're on YouTube live. Wave to all your fans. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going viral right now just because of that that wave? Right. Everyone's gonna like oh, he's, add. He's starting the countdown. Okay. Oh, countdown before we start. Okay. <laughs> Ten, this is so exciting. Nine, ooh, eight, countdown. Seven. Ooh, six. Ooh. It's getting exciting. So exciting. Is there going to be fireworks? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> is that the Good explosion? evening, everyone. My name is Lena Ye. I am a student at BHS High School, a part of the AAC, the Asian American Club. And tonight, I will be one of your hosts for tonight's live Q&A. And hi, my name is Grace O, oh, and I'm a junior at Lexington High School, and I'm part of the Chinese American Association of Lexington's AAPI Youth Volunteer Group. Welcome everyone here tonight. This evening, we are honored to invite Larissa and Baldwin, the director and producer of the award-winning film Far East Deep South, to our live Q&A interview. If any participants have any questions for Ms. Lam or Mr. Chu, please type them in the <laughs> Q&A function and at the bottom of your screens, and Lena and I will try our best to answer them throughout the interview. We want this to be an interactive Q&A, so feel free to type any questions. And make sure you address us by Mr. Chu. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, no, no. First name basis is good. <laughs> yeah, um, welcome, Ms. Lam and Baldwin, to this live Q&A <laughs> session. We are so happy that you could be here with us today. But um, to start off, would you guys like to introduce yourselves? Sure. Um, my name is Larissa Lam, and I'm actually married to him, Baldwin Chu. So she's officially a Chu. But... Uh, yes, legal. Oh, don't tell anyone. Yeah. <laughs> officially a Chu, uh, professionally still Lam, which is my maiden name. Um, I was born and raised in Los Angeles area, uh, and um, I of um, Chinese descent. My parents were both born in Shanghai, and um, even though my dad's Cantonese, long story, but that's this is about his story of today. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I worked in the music industry for about 20 years, still work in the music industry. And um, when I went to Mississippi for the first time in 2014 with his family, we stumbled across what many of you seen in Far East Deep South. We found out that there were a lot of Chinese in Mississippi, maybe not compared to how many were in California, but there were still quite a few more than just his grandfather and great grandfather. And then I became a documentary, documentary director <laughs> and we're so grateful to be here today. Maybe next time when we do this, I should try to introduce you, see if I can get all those things. Yeah, that's only like half, not even half <laughs> my story. <laughs> um, my name is Baldwin Chu. Uh, some people know me by my stage name, Only One. I'm a hip hop artist, also uh, rap and beatbox. But uh, for right now, I am a filmmaker and the producer of Far East Deep South. Um, I actually have a background in engineering, but um, I thought entertainment was a little more fun. Not that engineering isn't. I still enjoy that. You're just creating something different. Yes. And engineers are creative, by the way. So, um, easily, And that's a whole nother that's conversation. That's a whole nother conversation. Right. <laughs> um, so I went from project managing engineering projects to project managing this film, uh, which is basically makes me a producer. <laughs> and I guess we can really see that creativity coming through with the film. So bravo on that end. But Thank you. So could you give us a quick rundown of what the film is about? Yeah, the film is, uh, takes you on a journey. Uh, oh, should we do the... Uh, no, this is how I like to describe coming it. Coming soon. No. Chinese American family walks into a museum in Mississippi. No. <laughs> Hilarity ensues. No. Um, we went on a family trip in 2014, as I mentioned, to go find your grandfather and great-grandfather's gravesite in you mean, Mississippi. You mean in a world. In where a world. people... Oh, yeah. sorry. And so, as you can see, we're going to have a little fun tonight. Just not have a, we're going to have serious conversation about the topic, but we're also going to try to be a little entertaining with this. <laughs> uh, so, we went to Mississippi, mm -hmm. and I had no idea that there was this whole rich history of Chinese in Mississippi. When we walked into the museum, if Actually, you've seen our film, what? your job was just to be babysitter. Right. So and, that's how the journey started. And so we walked into the Mississippi Chinese Heritage Museum, which a lot of you saw in the film. And many of you may have had the same reaction as I did is why is there a Chinese museum in the middle of Mississippi? And that's when I realized there had to have been a significant population with history to warrant a whole museum. And that's exactly what we discovered. And so that's what the film takes you on a journey on finding your roots because you didn't know anything about your grandfather. Nope. 
And that's when she decided to make it into a film after we discovered that, wow, there were so many, there were so many things happening in the Mississippi Delta in the South um, that related to the early Chinese, um, especially when it came to how we got there, um, why we stayed there, how we were able to stay in that community, um, even during the Chinese exclusion and um, segregation era. And eventually even, you know, the, the relationships between the black community and the Chinese community are living together during those times. And if you haven't had a chance to see the movie, I believe you still have one more day till tomorrow awesome. if you signed up to be able to watch the movie. Um, and so, um, and you can definitely watch our trailer too um, on our website, fareastdeepsouth.com if you haven't had a chance to see it. Nice. Um, that's actually really cool of you guys to, you know, it's actually a really cool discovery. You know, it's just like, oh, one day just waltz into a museum. Next day I'm, pro I'm producing this like really cool movie about, you know, my, my family's history. But um, we were wondering what inspired the both of you to produce slash make the film Far East Deep South? Well, a lot of it really is growing up in California and not learning a whole lot about Asian American history. I mean, I think the extent of what I learned growing up was railroads, and then we kind of disappear from the history books and you don't hear anything about Asians until Japanese internment during World War II. Nowadays, there's a little bit more, um, but even then you get maybe a sentence or two about the Chinese Exclusion Act. You learn a little bit about the Vietnamese, refu you know, refugees of Vietnam War, and there's not a whole lot of in between. And then it gives you a sense that like, oh, we weren't important in this country. Oh, we're oh, constantly immigrants and perpetual foreigners, you know, and then to discover that we were in the American South, which we all learn about. We all learned about segregation and nowhere in our history books did we learn that the Asians were impacted too. And I should say not just the Asian community, but any community of color, not just the black community was impacted by segregate, segregated laws. And so for me, you know, I never liked history to be honest. And I hope my history teacher isn't saying that <laughs> even though I took AP history and did really well, but I never felt a personal connection because I couldn't relate to, you know, white guys in wigs during the revolutionary war and I didn't necessarily relate to the black experience of the South, you know, when we learn our history. And then now going to Mississippi, it all kind of came together. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we are part of this country and our histories do matter. We just don't know about it. I would say the same thing at her as her, except that I actually don't even remember learning about um, Transcontinental Railroad, even in high school or even the Japanese internment. I don't even remember. You learning. just didn't pay attention. Well, it could or your teachers too. didn't tell you, right? Because they just skipped over okay, those chapters. Yeah, that's kind of true too. Because it's up to the teachers, right? It could be in your history books, but if your teacher doesn't emphasize it or talk about it, then you'll never learn about it. Yeah. But I, I do remember <laughs> hating history though, growing up. And I think it wasn't until this experience that I actually started to really love history. And the same thing like what Larissa said. Um, it's because now I feel like I'm a part of American history. Whereas before growing up, I always felt like I wasn't sure. Am I an American? I think I'm an American. I was born here, but then no one treats me like an American. So, and I don't read about being an American as part of American history. So I think this, this film and what we learned and what we discovered really opened up my eyes um, to like learning more, not just in the deep South, but throughout America. Yeah, Chinese were not just in the South or in California. We were in pretty much every Everywhere. state. Uh, so there's a lot more history. And I, I think that's the beauty of making these films is having, I guess, youth like us seeing representation in the media, in our textbooks. And I think that's a really big part and really big impact, like how, why this film is so impactful is just because we do see that representation, we do see that we are part of history. And I know Larissa, you mentioned about like Chinese segregation specifically and how we didn't really know where we fit. So in your documentary, you mentioned that Chinese segregation was mentioned rarely or not at all at schools. So how do you think this influenced discrimination against the Asian community? Well, I think, you know, one, when people don't know that the Asian community has had a history of discrimination, and so segregation was one of it. We learned that Jim Crow laws often, you know, many times applied to the Chinese community. You saw in our film um, personal testimonies for Chinese that are still living that had to go to a segregated one-room schoolhouse of all Chinese only. They not only couldn't go to white schools, they actually, in the state of Mississippi, they couldn't even go to black schools in some areas. And so they had to have their own school. Um, and of course, 
course, a lot of the other discrimination, like not being able to live in white neighborhoods, they had to live, you know, with the black community, they they could not live in all the other neighborhoods, or even own property and during certain periods of time. Um, And then, of course, we don't mention the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, another discriminatory law, um, which again, if we don't learn about it, people might have this model minority myth, you know, perception of our community, right? Like, we're all a bunch of crazy rich Asians, like we're all good at math, we're all successful. And unfortunately, history doesn't show that even current statistics don't bear that out that actually a fourth of the Asian American community is living below the poverty line, but we don't hear about that we don't see that portrayed. And so, so important to learn about that not to dwell on it or to continue to say we're victims, but to have perspective that, you know, every people group that has come through this country as immigrants has gone through some hardship, and some people still go through those hardships even today. Yeah, and I, I would add just that um, with the way with perception um, growing up, you know, I, I'm so I'm so glad that you guys are moderating this because when I was in high school, I would never have even thought that something like this would be possible. Um, you know, I went, so, you know, in the film, we talked a little bit about like, you know, how where me and my brother went to school in the outskirts of Sacramento, not not really in even the city of Sacramento, which is the capital of, Sac- of California, but like a suburb. And so we didn't we didn't really have any representation at all so growing up i always felt like i was foreign or or i would have to try to decide like all my friends would be like that's the chinese guy that's the chinese guy but i was always looking like well but i was born here in america just like all of you so why am i the chinese guy and why aren't you the african guy why aren't you the russian guy why aren't you the german guy or the mexican guy like you they they were all americans but i happened to be the only one that was the chinese guy so um I definitely appreciate you guys for being here and hopefully you know you see yourself represented um, not just in our film but in your lives and as you hopefully you know hopefully you'll like history a lot more than i do um you know actually one thing that i thought was really interesting about the film was that during the film you mentioned you included that um asian american the asian community was helping out the black community during hard times So we were wondering what exactly inspired you guys to include that relationship between the Black and Chinese communities that is so rarely seen today. Yeah, I think one of the things that was important to me, um, and I I can speak for Baldwin in the sense that both of us have been blessed with a lot of friendship with members of the Black community. Um, You know, some of the most important people in my life in my life have been black and so it was very natural for us to like wonder like you know when we see you know stereotypical portrayals you know of any like ethnic minority you know ways you know i don't automatically think like if somebody is shown on tv or in the news as being black and being a a thief like i don't think oh all black people are thieves because that's not my experience like all my friends are like not that way but unfortunately i know there's a lot a segment of the population that does feel that way or even within the you know to look at ourselves in the mirror as an Asian community, you know, unfortunately, sometimes there's a very narrow view that gets shown of the black community, and that there are prejudices and, 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 you know, misperceptions. And so for us, it was really important, I think, to show another side and a historical side that most of us didn't know about, because most of the times in current times, we think about the tensions, and especially growing up in LA. In fact, today is the anniversary of the LA riots. And we're actually after this event going to go to an event um, in commemorating that. And so growing up in LA, that was my lens. And yet my friendships didn't reflect that. And now learning about the history of the South, that there was a very friendly and a very respectful relationship between the Chinese and the black community um, is something I really wanted to show. Yeah, one of the first things I did when I was transitioning from engineering into filmmaking was when we um, was that the audience is smart enough to know when something is fake. And so as a filmmaker, we have to make things that are authentic. So for us to go into Mississippi and then start hearing stories from the Chinese community about how Chinese gave credit to the black community and they all live together, that was kind of one sided. I wanted to really hear from the black community. Is everything I'm hearing from these old Chinese people and historians and other people, is that true? Did we really help you, you know, or is there something else? So I think for us to have to go back to the to the black community was is our way of being authentic because and we had to show it in our film because that's what happened we didn't just put it in there to make it look good or look diverse we put it in there because that's really what happened um the thing that we found out though it wasn't just you know yes the the chinese grocery store owners extended credit but 
it wasn't that it was just to help the black community. The black community was helping the Chinese community at the same time because, you know, we, we, we learned about the Chinese exclusion now and the Chinese Exclusion Act actually barred Chinese people from getting labor jobs. They really did not want Chinese getting labor jobs. So how are you going to work? How are you going to make money? Well, fortunately, black people still had the opportunity to do labor, so they were able to earn money in that way. How was the Chinese people able to do that? They weren't able to. So they had to heavily rely on the entire black community to be able to be their customers and to be on their side and to even develop relationships. Yeah, because, you know, Chinese were not necessarily welcomed in white neighborhoods, as we mentioned, not just for living, but even for doing business. So basically, this film is not just about representing the Asian community, but more like humanity as a whole. Hey, yeah, I like how you said I like that. how you said that. And I think part of it is we don't live in isolation, right? You know, if you're living in Boston area, Lexington, Belmont, I mean, you, you know, your family might be Asian, but your neighbors are not necessarily Asian. You know, the people that you work with or go to school are not necessarily all Asian. And, and same thing within the South is a lot of times I think the Asian and American community, especially when we talk about histories, like we tend to focus on just our side of the story, which is understandable because we know our side of the story, but we don't live in isolation. And for us, and, and this is our approach to even why we want this film and, and this history to integrate it into American history is because again, we're part of the larger story. It's not just Chinese American history or Asian American history. It is American history. And we interacted with black community. We interacted with the white community. And even if those interactions were unfriendly sometimes with the white community, like that all needs to be shown. And we wanted to see, I mean, thankfully in, in you know, some cases there were some very nice white people that, <laughs> that apparently respected your grandfather. Um, but we also know as a large segment of society, um, the people that probably didn't want to talk to us, <laughs> um, you know, that did resent those people and communities of color because this is again um, pre-civil rights era um, you know that is also fair to show in, in our experience um, you know we wanted to show all the history as much as we could I think I think we live in a in a world and in a country where we actually we at least have a hope that we can try to learn from the past and make something better in the future so we hope that by pointing out some of the things that have not been shared previously in our history um, you know, the, the stories that have been hidden. We hope that these stories will not simply just bring out sadness or, or darker times, but we hope that the reality of it shows that, like you said, th this is a human issue and humans have feelings, humans have sensitivities, humans go through suffering. And I think we can, if you, if you look at just how we are as people, we grow together better when we realize that we suffered together. It doesn't mean that we want to continue to suffer forever, but relationships happen, relationships grow because we find commonality in the way, in the ways we've found we've suffered together. But what, what really brings us to the future is us finding ways to celebrate and succeed together at the same time. And I think right now we're trying to, there's just too much in society where we're trying to succeed on our own. We're trying not to like bring people in with us. We're not trying to extend ourselves to other people. And um, I, I think that's, that's something we really need to work on. And I hope our film shows that, hey, if we were joined together, even in a harsh time, then why, why can't we do that today? Yeah, and, and that, I think it develops greater empathy if we have a better understanding of not just our own story, but how the other stories of others around us you know, are impacted. And I, I think that's a really important message is just to really build that relationality between all of us. And I think that's really reflected through, I mean, just seeing throughout the film how different people just came up to you and were like, hey, actually, we know your grandfather is, is really cool just seeing how someone that you don't even know can contact you and really help you create like find your grandfather and find your lineage. And I was looking through the chat and I think Tracy asked a really great question about um, talking more about your uh, about the emotional journey as you learned about your family's history and what that meant to you. Well, definitely emotions uh, were pretty high during the you know discovery and the making of the film. Um, my dad, you know, just you know didn't usually show his emotions. You know, uh, in fact, he's a man of few words. Yeah, in fact, I think you you heard my brother tell you that um, 
Well, he, he's never seen my dad cry before or Not something? until we went to the museum and, for spoiler alert for those of you who haven't seen it, we found a very significant Bible in, yeah. the, in, the, in the museum. And I think I've only seen my dad cry once when he had a message that his mom had passed away in Hong Kong. Um, so when we went back to Mississippi, I, mean, I, think, I think this is why in the film where, you know, you, you see my dad saying his, his feelings were mixed because not you know he had to go through his entire life believing and just coming to grips with his family and his own family that he was probably abandoned and that his father didn't love him or didn't want him and that he simply came to america to this land of opportunity this mountain of gold so that he can live this great life in america and leave his whole family back in china to suffer and i think he had to just kind of come to terms with that and now that he's in America, he wanted to just forget all that stuff and just kind of get those opportunities for him and his family as well. When we discovered this in Mississippi and we started digging things out, he started to have to recall things in his past that he spent a lifetime trying to block. And, you know, it, it's it's decades of pain. And I think it was something that was really revealing to Baldwin. Sorry, I'm speaking for you now. It's okay. That is revealing to you. Right. <laughs> but that... I don't, you know, as parents, you know, and children, right? Like you, you look at your parents, especially if they're like first generation immigrant and you, maybe they'll tell you like, oh, I came to this country, you know, having to go to school and put myself through, you know, I have four jobs to, to provide for the family. At least that's what I heard from my dad, you know, and, you know, I did all this for you. I sacrificed all this for you. You hear that part of it, but you don't always hear the other internal suffering and the whole side of like growing up without a dad and how tough it was um, to work in this country and adapt to a new country like that part, you know, he didn't really recognize and I think acknowledge um, and appreciate, I think, until we went into this journey. Am I, am I right? That, that is true. That is true. <laughs> and I don't think your dad, I think, really honestly had processed a lot of how growing up without a dad, you know, really impacted and, and framed his worldview. I think it helped me understand, like, you know, when we had tensions between us, um, it helped me realize that, like, you know, my dad never had a role model of how to be a dad. And, and so, so if he made mistakes, um, maybe I should grant him a little bit of grace because he had no one to help. At least, at least I have an I have an advantage. I have a privilege now when I you know raise my daughter that I seen how it, it was like to have a father my entire life. It's something that he didn't have. So I, I think you know those things have really brought me and my dad together. Um, you know, a lot a lot better these days. Yeah, I think that's actually very relatable to many people in the Asian community, you know, because there's actually, I think you mentioned in your film, right, that um, there were a lot of other people who were in, were in history, but they, but they never got to find out about their background. Is that true? Yeah. Um, and actually, it was probably like really hard for your father to open up at the beginning and for everyone to, you know, when they first came together. So um, we were wondering, what was your experience producing the film with everyone, you know, at first? Was it like hard? Was it easy? And did you guys face any challenges along the way? Well, yeah. I, well, regarding his dad, we didn't really tell him. I mean, when we first went to Mississippi, we didn't know we were making a movie. We were just going on a family trip. And just like every family, you got your phones. You just take video of your family vacation. And so that's why you see some shaky footage. And I mean, we literally like ran out of like, uh, like, camera space on we had a nice camera but we we only brought one chip uh for for memory because we didn't know we were going to find that much stuff and we had to go run out to, to like a local a walgreens, walgreens to go like, get hey, do you guys extra have sd, SD cards <laughs> sd card um and and so for us it was a surprise one to be making a film um but two after that first trip to mississippi i realized like more people needed to see the story because i just couldn't believe what was happening and hopefully when you've seen the film too like you're feeling the way i felt was like how in the world are we finding all these people how are we finding this information we had nothing and we ended up discovering and meeting all these people and you know it just was surprise after surprise and so that part um was that part was easy in a sense because it kind of all fell into place. The hard part was at some point we had too much information 
And especially with the history, because we went from knowing like nothing, I mean, just in society, in education, and then personally, to learning so much history that we wanted to cram all of it in. And, and so we weren't able to do that and really kind of parsing what the most important thread line storyline was, which is his his father's experience through this and so everything that we told in the story had to kind of connect to his family otherwise we basically had to throw it out and it's like bonus features on the dvds which some of your libraries by the way <laughs> have um in case you want to check those out um to watch the yeah. bonus features and my director's commentary if you like to hear me talk uh-huh <laughs> especially if you like to hear her talk I, I turned I turned that part off. I'm just kidding. Oh yeah. Oh, what? But I was gonna say I forgot to say like with your dad, like he didn't yes. know we were making a movie, and so when we decided we were gonna make a longer movie, in a sense we didn't completely tell him. He kind of knew, but I couldn't bring a whole film crew. He that was a bit of a that challenge. That was what you wanted to do. You wanted well, to bring I wanted a film to do because I wanted to look nice and everything. But and I, I was like, he's not gonna do it. And I knew that he would be spooked because he's a very private person, and so. There's a lot of footage actually in our final film that I never intended to use in our final film because I just it was just a conversation between me and him. Um, you know, when he's flipping through the photo albums on the table, you know, in the dining room, uh, that was never originally supposed to go in the movie. That to, was just me just to find out what are these photos. But it became such a, an important part of the storytelling that I, I included it to show how how private he is. All the scenes that you see in the film with my dad during the interview. I was not there. It was so private that I was not allowed in the room. Well, with his so single his solo, sit down, his solo you know, sit down interviews. Um, so Larissa did all those interviews by herself. I got kicked out, you know, because every well, time, they, I, yeah, because every time I, I tried to ask him something, he didn't want to talk to me about it, right? So Larissa kicked me out. He, so everything you guys learned and heard from that scene, all those scenes of him speaking, that was the first time I learned about his past as well when I was going through all the footage after she oh, was and done. <laughs> when your father heard that you guys were making this documentary, how did he <laughs> feel about it at first? I think one of his first comments was, why? Why are you doing this? Like, why are you putting this out there? I thought this was just going to be a family video for ourselves. He kept saying, like, I, I'm not wealthy. I'm not famous. Why do people care about me? But I think those are the exact reasons why people care because people relate to him. He is your everyman. And, you know, I think there is unfortunately this tendency, I'm going to, I'm going to call my own people out, you know, in the Chinese community, especially to kind of lift up those who have status, right? Like that's a thing in our, you know, in our culture. And for him, I think, you know, he was thinking, I, I am nobody. I'm not an official. I'm not a, you know, pol you know, I'm not you know, anybody famous. famous why i'm not a leader and it's because he is that person that could be your father your uncle your brother you know your dad mm -hmm. and that's why i think people gravitate towards him um and just his story is remarkable so when we showed the film to him for the first time like we didn't i, I don't we didn't show him any of the previous cuts we had like 20 or 30 previous revisions and it wasn't until we were fully done that we finally said okay dad you could watch this and then I think we both sat all we were watching him watch the film. So he's I was so the scared movie. he was gonna go. We're like watching Why are him. you showing me crying so much? Right? Please don't let people see this. And then I had this conversation with him afterwards because he was like, Really, why do you have to do this? And he liked the movie. Let, let's just say like, he did like the movie. He, he was the crying movie. the whole time. So I sat down with him finally one time and I was like, Look, Dad, this you you think that we're putting you out there, but but really this movie is not just about you. It's not about you. It's about something bigger than you. It's about our entire community. It's about American history. It's about how we treat each other as, well, like you said, humanity, as humans. Um, and it's, and you need to see that this film is not, is not just gonna be about us. This film is gonna be bigger. And this film has to affect more people so that we can come together. And, and we had this constant talk about it. And then he finally looked at me and he just gave me this look and he goes, okay. <laughs> and that was it. And so, um, so he's been a strong supporter ever since we did He's that. watched the film probably about like 30 or 40 times. Maybe. He cries every single time. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, really? Wow. Oh, my God. Yeah, I sometimes wonder, like, I didn't know if it was going to be like reliving, you know, the, the painful memories to watch the film, but I think it's in some ways very cathartic for him. This has really been, I think, his 
for lack of a better word, it's been his like therapy session, I think, talking through it and, and processing it. And I think the the movie has given him an opportunity to, to heal. Mm -hmm. It must have been really special for your father because you said earlier that like your father never cries, right? And yeah, when he you said when he saw this movie, he just like started <laughs> crying, you know, so it definitely must have been really special for him. And we actually do have a Q&A person from the Q&A who asked on the film. And it says, thank you, very touching film. One part that I couldn't get is how to understand that the birth of certificate of your grandfather was in California. How did that happen that way? Yeah, so my, my great grandfather, the birth certificates for my great grandfather, he was not born in Mississippi. He was born in San Francisco and he made his way to Mississippi. So you have to kind of look back at the times. This is the 18, 1800s. 100s. So he was born in 1877. People were born in homes. They were not born in hospitals necessarily. So there right. wasn't documentation the same way they do now. And then in 1882, we get this Chinese Exclusion Act that happens. Chinese Exclusion Act was really much stronger in the West Coast. So being in California in that late 1800s, because Chinese Exclusion Act didn't just happen in 1882. There was a lot of things leading to the 1882 Exclusion Act starting from the 1860s, right? All the way, even earlier, you know, once when the Chinese got there. So living in California as a Chinese man was not that easy. Yeah, there was actually some riots and some violence towards Chinese, you know, so, it's like it's happening all over again with anti-Asian violence, but yeah. the original anti-Asian violence was happening back in the 1800s. So he found a way to get to Mississippi where there was other jobs, he, there was other opportunities. He went with another person. And so that's how he made his way through Louisiana, um, you know, and into up into Memphis and then down back into Mississippi. Yeah, I think that's that's a really good point is just the way in which history kind of sometimes history repeats itself. And one of the things about having the film is that we can really highlight what history is so that we don't repeat those same offenses that we currently so that we don't repeat those same offenses in the current day. Um, and also, Baldwin, you mentioned that you are a famous rapper and actor and hip hop artist. So we are wondering how your background as a hip hop artist affected the style of the production of the documentary. Well, we had to throw in one of my songs. Yeah, so. <laughs> I Sam, rap in Chinese in that Chinatown scene. Yeah, that's um, him oh, rapping. That. That we actually had an earlier cut where we actually talked a little bit more about this tension that me and my dad had because, I mean. He I, loves hip hop. Yeah, right. Um, Oh, no, he I grew doesn't. up. I grew up playing violin or viola. He really liked the classical. He's like, "That's real music." But then I was like, really listening to hip hop. So there was this tension in our household about rap music and what's real music and stuff like that. And and there was this tension growing up. Um, you know, it was basically he didn't understand how who I was as an American young kid growing up, and I didn't really understand him being this uh, immigrant trying to live in a foreign country to him but yet trying to be american and trying to serve this country yeah. and he you know again going back to not really having a father figure he didn't have a father to teach him what it's like to be an american in a country well but. and also to give some greater contact and then you can finish your point is that you know hip-hop back in those days and like the 90s and <laughs> stuff started to date you but their gangster rap was really popular and that's what his father saw now baldwin raps about dim sum and thermodynamics and god so like not exactly good, gangster positive, rap positive right topics. positive rap he doesn't cuss you know all that and you know his dad just again stereotyped and if you actually really know the history of hip-hop you know it actually isn't even rooted in gangster rap it's really more of a political movement you know coming out um and so it's more of a free of expression and a very intellectual expression as it is but um you know his he didn't understand that so he just labeled it as oh no you're not gonna be a gangster that's why i married this woman <laughs> she loves hip-hop like, if you didn't like rap music, I'm not marrying you. So again, that's the importance <laughs> of history, you know, not just about like Asian American history, but even history of music. Sorry, I, I, I'll stop with my ethnomusicology lesson here. I tried, go, to, go. I, tried, I tried to convince my dad, though, that that <laughs> rap music actually originated in China with the Peking Opera, because, you know, it's rhythm with poetry, you know, with uh, with performance and had political messages, which is kind of like the yeah. beginning of hip hop. So. I think almost every culture has some type of spoken word you know, form, uh, art form, um, if you look actually across the, <laughs> the, the world. Oh, here we're going into the ethnomusicology lesson again. <laughs>
Yeah, and I think um, you like talking about like kind of that generational difference, if that kind of makes sense, and that kind of dichotomy between um, Asian immigrants and the Asian American experience, just because there the context really matters and kind of like the environment in which you grow up kind of defines um, the way that you see things. So my question is, I guess, how do you think this film represents that difference in generation? And how do you think um, maybe we can remedy that or like spread a, uh, spread like information about that? Yeah, I think um, one of the things we discovered through this journey was um, acknowledging the older generations that their history and their stories matter. I think, you know, growing up, we're like, ah, you old people, you don't know anything, or you just don't understand. And, and your dad says that. And, and he, you know, he says the same thing about me too, right, growing up. But I think what happened was we started acknowledging that their history mattered, that their experiences mattered. And that, yeah, I may not get it because I'm in a new generation, but um, I think we as a younger generation need to let, let them know that we're not trying, even though we're trying to do something in this current generation, even if we're trying to do something for the future generation, it doesn't necessarily mean we need to discount what happened in the previous generation. And I think that's what you know the older generation really wants to know. They want to be acknowledged that they didn't struggle and work hard just to be forgotten and to be dismissed. Um, at the same time, I think the older generation has to understand that you know we and you are the future. So you know the the whole the whole purpose of them, all immigrants coming to America, is not so that we can continue to live the same way they did when they first came to America. How sad would it be if I was, uh, you know, if, if my great great, you know, my great grandfather, if my great grandfather expected me to still be running a grocery store in Mississippi right now, you know, and, and just barely making it and not doing anything else, right? The whole point is that we want the next generation to learn from the past and experience something better. Actually, earlier in the in the interview, you said that you spent your childhood in California, which is a state with a relatively large Asian population. So we were curious, how exactly did that affect your experiences growing up? Did it like um, make you closer to Asian culture? And like, how exactly did that affect your relationships with older generations? Hmm. You wanna go first on this one? Well, I grew up in a town called Diamond Bar, um, which when I was growing up was very white. Um, I was one of the only Asian kids in my class in elementary school. Now, if you have any friends or relatives in Diamond Bar, it's very heavily Asian. And in fact, it skews very Chinese. And so I actually saw the change. So I got to experience both being one of the only Asians and then being among a bunch of Asians. And then I went to UCLA, which is University of Caucasians Lost Among Asians, as the joke goes goes with the, the our letters UCLA, in our, yeah. UCLA the acronym um and and that's not totally true because there's still there's still a lot of non-Asians <laughs> um it's just funny to say that um uh, but you know I so I got to see both sides yet however much I have a lot of Asian friends I think I still never fully felt a hundred percent American until maybe I stepped into Mississippi and discovered this history. I, there was always an inferiority complex because what I saw in media, you know, what I saw in leadership, whether it was in corporations, in government, um, in the public sphere, did not reflect me and did not look like me. And so, um, you know, and even I worked, I've worked as a talk show host. I've, I've been, a, I've been a singer. I've been a songwriter. You don't know how many times people have, even within our own community, have said, "Oh, you sing in Chinese, or or you're doing stuff in Asia," and every space that I've worked in, I've pretty much been almost the only Asian when I've worked in entertainment. And, and so that was always really strange to me that I constantly had to prove myself, not just to non-Asians, but even to the Asian community that I wasn't just an Asian person, you know, just an Asian singer or an, you know, an Asian, an American, uh, an American, I'm an American songwriter, you know, I'm an American TV host, like all my co-hosts are not Asian. <laughs> For me, it's um, I, I, I grew up in San I was born in San Francisco, so there was plenty of Asian and Chinese people there. You know, we went to Chinatown all the time. I think our, our church was in Chinatown. So heavily exposed to Chinese and Asian culture and even the language. But then when I moved to Sacramento to the outskirts of it, all of a sudden it switched. And I, I, I realized that there was a change. There was a difference. I felt very different. I was no longer normal. I was the abnormal. I was now different. And I, I didn't have to prove myself in, in San Francisco. Um, in San Francisco, I was 
uh, the captain. I was always the you first You were just one. like everyone else. I was picked first, you know, you know, in, in, in recess. You know, I could play quarterback in, in, the high, in, in, in San Francisco. But when I went to Sacramento, I grew up there. It was like, okay, now I'm the last one picked just because I'm like, why am I the last one picked? I'm still pretty athletic. Or I had to start proving myself. Like, and, and, I, and eventually I did, but it was a lot more work. And so, um, so that it's was, a process of education, like, yeah. you know, and, and that takes effort, you know, to do that. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point you make is that how it's so unfortunate that um, there isn't that much like Asian American representation, let's say in school textbooks or whether within the government or within corporations. So kind of bouncing off of that, how do you think you can increase Asian American representation in those areas? I think the first thing to do is education. I think, um, uh, well, let me backtrack a little bit. I want to give my spiel about the perceptions. Okay. <laughs> so I, I believe, you know, what the problem we are having is the way people are perceiving us is incorrect. So what are the things that influence our perception or people's reflect, re perception of us? Well, there's three things, I think. There's education, it's, it's, there's, it's what we learn, it's what we see, and what we experience. So what we learn obviously hasn't been that much because you're going to school, I went to school, most people have gone to school and we haven't learned much about who Asian Americans really are and the things that they've done and what we've done in this country. So strike one, okay, what, what, what we learn. Number two is what we see. So we, you know, media, we haven't been able to see, you know, we don't see ourselves represented correctly in the history of media, whether it be music, entertainment, movies, film, all that stuff. Um, so that's strike two. The third one is experience. So the experience comes from like, well, how do, how do people experience us? How many of us in the Asian community have friends that are not Asian? How many of us that are Chinese immigrants come in here and continue to speak Chinese for the rest of their lives and continue to live only in the Chinese community? How, how, how do other people experience you, right? So I think for most Asians and for most people that are not Asian, they don't have a true and a very good diverse experience with somebody that is Asian. So that's strike three. So, so we, we have three strikes, we're out. Enter education is a hard thing to crack, but we're trying to get into that. Entertainment is a hard thing to crack, but we're, we're working on that. But the easiest thing we can do is the relationships that we can build. So are we in our community taking the first steps to reach out to people that are not Chinese, that are not Asian, and educating them, telling them our stories? I like to call it dim sum diplomacy, right? Dim sum diplomacy is like, how many times am I gonna go out to eat dim sum with somebody that's not Chinese? Can I bring in non-Chinese people, non-Asian people, or different types of Asian people to have dim sum with me? And can I go out and eat other foods with other people? Can I get to truly know other people in, the, in, in relationships and experiences. And I think that's what we saw in Mississippi. There were relationships that were built between the Chinese and the black community. We had both Chinese and black people saying, recollecting that when they were a child, they would sit upstairs in the balcony with Chinese people when all the white people were on the bottom, right? These are built on relationships. It wasn't like, you know, everything in society told the Chinese people that they shouldn't be sitting with black people, yet they'd sat together, they played together. And so where is that today? Are we, are we now still doing that? Are we yeah. sitting in movie theaters together, eating together, or are we doing our own thing? And I think, it, and, and to kind of build off of that, that's where it's important to build allyships. And, you know, and I noticed, I wanna thank all the organizations that have come together to help promote this event and the whole weeks long event around our film. Um, it's remarkable working with um, all the different Belmont groups. I know Lexington had a bunch of groups and, you know, I know one of the groups was an African-American group that, you know, was promoting this, this film. And I think that's important where, you know, those in the Asian community are reaching out to those outside the Asian community and partnering in events and seeing the intersections and and inviting each other into each other's spaces um, and that doesn't happen enough where sometimes we do a Chinese New Year celebration and it's just for us but it's important to invite the rest of the community to to, to a lot of what we are uh, you know experiencing personally but as a culture as a whole because that's the only way that they're going to learn because if we're not learning it in books as Baldwin says or in you know media thankfully there is a, a movement in entertainment you know you know we're part of that thankfully that is helping to increase that in helping to increase diverse stories um, but it takes all of you out there to get involved um, and to demand one 
be the change. I know it sounds really cliche, but also demand that change. So for instance, if you're on campus and you know you want to organize events, you know, with other other groups on campus or even asking your teachers, hey, you know what, can we talk more about Asian American history? We don't seem to be getting enough of it. Or if you're in English class, it's like, how can we don't ever read books with Asian American authors, you know? Um, and so those are the types of things that students or even as parents get involved with the PTA and going to school board meetings to affect the these types of changes for more representation. So going back to how we all, you know, you were talking about perceptions. If we can change everyone's perception of us in our community, then people will get to really know who we really are. We're not just that perpetual foreigner. We're not just the person that are stereotyped. And when people truly understand who we are, then that's when we'll start seeing those changes represented in media as well, because they're because media people making creating that content will create what they see and what they know. Well, right now they unfortunately don't know or see very much. But once they start understanding who we are, and, and then their perceptions of us yeah. will change, and then we'll be represented better. And last point, because I know we have a lot of other questions, but you know going back to what I was talking about allyship and what he was talking about, you know, that is why it is important that those who are not Asian are on your side to, to also advocate that this is important because a lot of times people just never think about it until we ask the question. It's like, so can you name a prominent Asian American historical figure? And it's like crickets, right? Maybe they'll say like Bruce Lee, or they'll say like every once in a while they'll say like Jackie Chan. I'm like he's not American, you know. <laughs> like they'll name somebody that isn't even American. And so for us to change the way that you know those answers are answered, it takes those outside of our community too to make those changes. Um, actually, and speaking of education, when I watched this film, it was really an eye opener for me because before, like I had heard of the Chinese Exclusion Act and like a. Uh, few other events with Chinese and U.S. history, but I really never got into like detail because schools really never mentioned it. So when I watched the film, I was like, oh, like all of these things happened and I never knew it, you know? So we were wondering, what do you guys think have been the biggest impact of the film so far? I think um, one of the biggest thing is that uh, I think people are starting to understand that there are consequences to, to the things that our country has done. So in this case, when we're talking about the Chinese Exclusion Act, there were consequences to it. It wasn't just a law that happened a long time ago. And so it affected our family. It affected our entire community in ways that we don't even know about. And so by blocking out that history, um, we basically said, it doesn't matter. You know, America doesn't, doesn't care about your history and it doesn't matter what might have come out of that history. But I think what people are starting to realize is that in, in this case, you're talking about the Chinese Exclusion Act, my dad his entire life had this gripe against his father because he thought he was abandoned but really it was the chinese exclusion act that separated our family for multiple generations it wasn't my grandfather's fault so how many of us have blamed in our community the fault of our ancestors for something tragic that happened because of family separation how many asian families have been separated not just chinese families but you know all Asians, you know, separated for multiple different reasons. How many of us are have been angry or upset at family members for that separation and have not talked about it when really it was because of some sort of policy, some sort of social construct, some sort of, um, you know, whatever it was, racism, political, communal, political or community or societal things that really force those separations in our family. Um, I think now people understand a little bit more like, hey, maybe it's not my father's fault. Maybe it's not my grandfather's fault. Maybe it was a system and now maybe we can start healing from this. Maybe we don't have to keep blaming our own people or our own family members. Right, yeah. And I think that goes again to the story of like building each other up instead of like tearing each other down, creating that sort of community. And I see in the chat, we have another question from Lindsay that's saying, um, would you please talk a little bit more about why you chose the name Far East Deep South for the film? Um, that was our editors. Um, in brief, it used we we had a really hard time coming up with the name. Um, the, an early version was When Far East Met Deep South, but it was just really long. And in the end, you know, he just said Far East Deep South. And just a side note, there's we purposely left out the comma. Normally, you would write it Far East comma Deep South. It's just Far East Deep South because we wanted to show that it was the blending of the two, you know, cultures, Far East and the Deep South, that there was no separation. 
By the way, there was questions in the Q&A chat too, so I wanna make sure we get to those as well. Um, we're not, so that people know we're not ignoring you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, there is a question from Tom saying regarding Baldwin's great grandfather who was born in San Francisco in 1877, what was the story of his parents? Where, where were they before San Francisco and did they go directly to Mississippi from there? Yeah, so my great grandfather was born in San Francisco. So we did find documents of my great great grandparents. Um, and you think you found something in a census that ties in? Yeah, your great great grandfather, according to our documents that we found at the National Archives, he was a cigar factory worker. And so doing a little bit of digging, we thought like, oh, we don't hear about that in our history books either. And I guess Chinese were not just recruited to the railroads, they were recruited to many, many other industries. Cigar making was one of them. Um, much fewer in numbers than the railroad, of course. But um, I did find a census document that showed, I believe, his grandfather's name as as being in 1870 uh, a census document um, and so your great-grandparents we have no idea how they got here they got here somehow um, and then had your great-grandfather and it was your great-grandfather as you previously mentioned that made his way actually down to Louisiana first before going to Mississippi yeah I, I want to answer Doug's question Doug Folsom hey how you doing long time uh, go Niners I know you're a Green Bay fan <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I thank you for asking about my dad. So in the film, you know, we said, yeah, you know, my dad was getting slower, he's getting older. So we really wanted to like capture as much. Well, I mean, my dad's even slower and <laughs> even older now uh, to answer your question. So, I mean, just, uh, yeah, keep him in your thoughts and your prayers. We, we, we'd really appreciate it, but he, he is doing the best he can to, to keep at it. He came out to a, he finally came out to a screening a couple of weeks ago um, and, you know, he toughed it out. So, um, he's hanging in there. <laughs> oh, that, that's good to hear. It's, it's good to hear that your father's doing well. And we have a question from Rob that's saying, a huge number of Chinese settlers in the Mississippi region originated from the Guangdong province of Southern China. Is there, is there any inspiration from this adventure and documentary where Mr. Chu learns to find his, your family history even further? Yes, we do have a potential part two, but it may not take us to China. And in all honesty, we were originally <laughs> going to go to China because we actually worked with the organization called My China Roots, um, who was fantastic. If you want to look for uh, your roots in China and you have no idea where to start, um, My China Roots might be a, a great place to help you. And if you mention um, our film, they'll give you a discount. Yes, <laughs> they will. <laughs> um, they're friends of ours. And um, they did a little digging for us. Um, unfortunately, something happened. COVID, I don't yeah. know, yeah. And that kind of- They stopped a... our trip over there. Right, so where are we going next, Baldwin? Well, eventually we might go back to China once they open that up, but we found something else about a year and a half ago, a little bit more interesting, I think. Um, we found some documents on my mom's side of the family. And what it was, was we found out that my great-grandfather on my mom's side uh, was a transcontinental railroad worker. And he ended up in Denver, Colorado. So, but he did not have as fortunate of a story as my grandfather, as Charlie Liu, my dad's side. Yeah, there's a whole history of a, a Chinatown that used to be in Denver and how Chinese actually kind of got driven out of Denver. And so that will be kind of our part two. We joke it's called Far East Rocky Mountains. It's not really <laughs> going to be the title, but we're going to Denver next. Yeah. All right. I know we got some more questions. Um, I think we have another question uh, from Lindsay. Why did you choose the con field as your background for the flyer? Is there any special reason behind that? Yeah. Well, I mean, I love, I mean, first of all, it's a beautiful scenery, but context with the cotton field is that, well, I don't know if you caught it in the film, but um, Chinese first went into Mississippi because of the cotton fields. Um, you know, slave, slavery had just been abolished. And so, um, the plantation owners needed to replace that that workforce and they found out that Chinese uh, were very efficient on the railroads so they purposely not only brought in brought in the ones from the railroad they went to China to recruit Chinese labor to work in the cotton fields and so for us growing up for me growing up I always thought of cotton fields as a place where um, you know the black community uh, and slavery and it was a part of that picture only 
when I found out that Chinese, early Chinese in the Mississippi Delta had a similar experience, um, then, you know, I felt like, hey, that's, that's something that we actually have in common. And it's, it's, it's actually a, not a beautiful thing. It's, it's a beautiful thing to see visually, but the stories of it is actually kind of dark. You know, it's hard. It's hard labor. People get cut. They're they're bleeding. Um, people have died. And and they are large. If you've never been to a plantation, and just to you can see. I mean, you see only part of it. The Baldwin standing in there, but it is just so large. You now you can understand why they needed so much, so much labor. labor. And and so in that beauty is hidden such darkness and ugliness and, and blood, sweat, and tears. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we actually have one more question from Az from Alabama, and he asks, if you want one thing about Asian American history to be taught in schools in death, what would it be? Just uh, one thing? My gosh. Okay, so, wow, just so can thing. I... Maybe can more I, than one. <laughs> yeah, well... There's, actually, there's a lot of things that we just... So. Yeah, I mean, selfishly, I, I'm definitely saying kind of the story it's, it's kind of a broad topic but like the the impact in the history of the chinese in different regions of the country really um as opposed to saying like we want a chapter just on you know chinese railroad workers or we just want one about uh the you know vietnamese experience in the south i mean i think all of those experiences in the country integrated into american history i think is for me the most important part um as opposed to just picking out just one chapter to, to go into depth, I, I really want to see a more of an integrated approach to teaching American history. You might have a different answer. <sighs> this is a hard one. I, I like I like what you said about that, because I feel like Asian American history has been a part of American history for so long that but nobody knows it. So like even when we're talking about Cesar Chavez, well, there was Larry Itliong who was side by side with him. Uh, you know, who's Filipino American? Who's Filipino for those of you who are not familiar with Larry Atlanta. So that's agriculture. When we're talking about things like the Napa Valley and winery, well, who built those caves and who who helped irrigate the land? Well, it was the early Chinese. So why don't we talk about that when we're talking about vindiculture? Or women's suffrage. There is someone named Dr. Mabel Lee who was out in New York who was a major advocate for women's voting rights. So there's a lot of figures that 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 are Asian American that played a role in shaping our you know what our country is right. today. Even civil rights movements, you know, there were there are Asian people that walked with Martin Luther King, uh, with Malcolm X. Uh, so, and even right now, as we talk about the Deep South, we've always learned about slavery. We've learned about segregation. We learned about what would happen there. Obviously, Chinese were there too, uh, and, and so it's so hard to just pick one. I just wish we were included in all that history because it would allow us to just be like, oh, we get it too. You know, we get it too. We had it too, we get it too, and we can move forward together too. Yeah, I, I think that's a really great point to bring up. And as we're nearing the end of our session, we have one last question from Tracy who says, what do you want your children to learn about fa your family's history? And I guess, what do you want the overall impact of your film to be? Um, yeah, and I want to thank you both. First of all, um, Lena and Grace, you guys have been doing an amazing awesome. job um, moderating um, snaps <laughs> all around for you. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I know there's a few other questions that we're not gonna be able to get to. And, you know, hopefully, um, you know, we can, you can join us in another session or, or you know, I, I saw there was a Tufts professor here. We, I will reach out to you definitely, and I'm going to drop our social media links in our in our chat box here as well, so that you can follow us or connect with us through our website. Um, what what was the question again? Sorry. <laughs> what do we what do we want our our future? And oh, our kids? our daughter to know our, and children to know. We made this for the future, didn't we? We did. I want to. I would say I want it to show that our stories matter, um, and it has always mattered. But it's up to us to make sure that the future generations know what those stories are. So we're making a very strong concerted effort to make sure that um, our daughter does learn history, learns that we are a part of history, but not just our history. We, we love it that she learns about Black history and Latino history and all the other histories too, right? Because that's, that's a part of American history. But we definitely want her to understand that being Asian is not something she should be ashamed of. Is um, I don't want her to grow up, I'm um, wondering what her identity is. I think 
for me growing up, one of the things that I never knew was like, when am I, when am I Asian and when am I American? Am I Chinese or am I American? Who, who considers me Chinese and who doesn't consider me Chinese? And do I have to pick? I don't want my daughter or, or the future generations or your generation to ever have to answer that question for yourself. And I want people to always accept you as, yes, you can be both. You can be American, fully American with a great history in whatever ethnic background you are. But you are fully American and you're fully something else too. And it's okay. And, and it's beautiful that way. Um, I think that's what the takeaway is. And I think if we understood our history, if we understand that, then it's easier for people to accept us as that American, as that have that American identity. Yeah, I mean, I don't want my daughter to face comments or questions, you know, about her validity as an American, especially now that we know she's sixth generation. We don't want to have somebody tell her go back to your country when she's never even stepped foot in China, right? Even though she's in a Mandarin immersion school and her Chinese is actually better than ours. But that's another point. <laughs> but you know, like we want her to know that she is fully Chinese in heritage, but she is also American in citizenship. You know, and that's something that that happens a lot is like, what you're denying your Chinese culture. I'm like, no, 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 we're not denying our culture, our Chinese culture, because I think a lot of other immigrant groups historically, like the Irish Americans or the Italian Americans, like I have friends that are very proud to be Italian American. And yet now they are fully embraced. There was a time they were not and they were also treated like second class citizens, but they are now embraced as being American. But they're also able to proclaim that they're proud and Italian. Yet if we say we're proud in Chinese, people consider us a foreigner continually, you know, or they think we're a traitor to our country. And so these are the types of things that we hope our daughter never has to deal with that people understand that heritage and citizenship can coexist and if anything you know our daughter is really great about you know uh telling others about history and she's learning history um she's only eight and she's telling people about history a very diverse history that we never got to learn and we hope she shares that with other generations too yeah, and that's an amazing message to pass on to the future generations. And I think that's really one of the major impacts of this film and why it's so important that people do watch and do learn about Asian representation and Asian history. So we want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. And I bet you've inspired many of our viewers today. And I know personally, I've learned a lot from the film. I've been really been inspired by both of you. So to end it off, Larissa and Baldwin, is there anything you'd like to share with the audience before we end today's session? Yeah, well, we have a, a major, you know, campaign with education. Um, we had signed a deal with the educational distributor New Day Films. And so if you know of schools or universities, and I know there's some people here um, that have already started contacting us, um, we would love to do more screenings or even at your companies. Um, we've been doing a lot of things with different ERG groups at, at different companies and institutions um, because, you know, our whole goal is to get people talking, to have these conversations, to educate the public um, so that more more people will know this history. Um, you have anything to add? Yeah, certainly. Um, we don't want this to be the height of our careers in this film. We want this to be the beginning of it. We want this to continue to grow. And we want the next generation and other future creators to be able to tell their stories. And I would just want to say, like, you don't have to be a filmmaker or, or, a, or a writer or anything like that to tell your stories. All you have to do is tell your stories. You can just record it. You can just make sure your next generation or your family members hear your story record it, write it down, ha you know, have it transcribed so that you can pass it on. Um, print some of your photos because like, we're in that digital age and photos get lost. So print some of that. That was critical to our research. Could you imagine if we went to Mississippi and like people are like, let me look at my hard drive instead of pulling out a scrapbook, you know what I mean? So like those yeah. are the things nowadays we take for granted. We can store everything on a phone. And if it and wasn't for- everything I know, and if, on our phone. <laughs> if it wasn't for the people that we found that actually kept hard copies of letters and mm -hmm. you know scrapbooks, like we wouldn't be here sitting talking to you today. Yeah. So, um, and oh, and just a couple of last things. I dropped a couple of links in the chat. Um, if you want a three minute rundown on Asian American history, we did a video that was a spoof on Hamilton called Asian American His make, make. Asian Americans Make History. It's on YouTube as well. You can Google that. Um, you can watch that. And um, we also have a podcast called Love Discovery and Dim Sum, um, where we talk about a lot of these issues on a regular basis and share more about history we've discovered. Those current topics. And current topics with an Asian American perspective on entertainment and uh, current news. But we've loved being with all of you. And, you know, again, feel free to reach out to us on social media or through our website. Um, the last link doesn't work. Which oh, link doesn't no. work? 
Love and Discovery podcast. Okay. Why not? Okay. Talk, Baldwin. While I do that, <laughs> I'll find you another link. <laughs> no, so seriously, um, hit us up on our website, uh, farisdeepsouth.com. Um, we have all our links li linked under there as well. And we love to stay connected. If your answer, if your, your questions didn't get answered, you can always shoot me an email that you can contact me straight through the website as well. Um, and I do answer all my emails. Sometimes it just takes me a little while, but, uh, we, we don't have people, we don't have bots or anything like <laughs> answering mails for us. Well, that's it for today's interview. Thank you everyone so much for watching. And thank you again, Larissa and Baldwin for taking the time to talk with us today. We're looking forward to your future projects and we definitely hope to see you again soon. Again, to learn more about the film Far East Deep South, you can visit their webpage, link in the chat below, and you can watch their film for free on Canopy. Thank you. Thank you everyone and hope thank to you. see you again. Thank in you person. So <laughs> yeah, in person, hopefully. Bye. <laughs> right. Bye.